We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Welcome, everyone, to Ask the Vet podcast. I appreciate your taking the time to join me today. As usual, I'm your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. I'm the Senior Veterinarian and Director of Pet Health Information here at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center in New York City, where this broadcast is coming from. On today's podcast, I'm very excited to be talking with my colleague, Helen Irving, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. She has a kind of an unusual background for someone who's running a veterinary hospital. And so I think you'll find her conversation fascinating and engaging. So I hope you'll stay tuned until we get to that part of the show. You can find the Ask the Vet podcast on the Sirius app and on all major platforms that host podcast. Thanks to AMC's special partnership with Sirius XM, we can bring you this podcast every month. If you want to stay current on important pet health information, just like and follow our show. I just want to remind everyone that the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center is the only level one veterinary trauma center in New York City and the largest not-for-profit animal hospital in the world. Now, later on in the show, I have a whole bunch of questions from pet owners this month. So if you want your pet question answered next month on the show, all you have to do is email me. The email address is really easy to remember, but if you don't have a pen, I'll give give it to you later again in the show as well. So the email address is askthevet at amcny.org. Again, askthevet at amcny.org. And that's how you get your questions answered on our show. And now for the trending animal of the month. It's time for the internet's most talked about animal. Who doesn't love a golden retriever? These dogs are the sweetest, prettiest, wonderful companion animals. So imagine being in the company of nearly 500 golden retrievers all at one time. That would be absolute heaven. Well, if you were in Scotland, a town called Gusikun specifically, a few weeks ago, you would have witnessed the largest grouping of golden retrievers ever. These dogs weren't just there by accident. They gathered to celebrate the anniversary of the golden retriever breed's founding. And there's a photo of all 500 dogs to prove it. Golden retriever lovers traveled from around the world to celebrate. They came from Ireland, Bavaria, Switzerland, Czech Republic, of course, the United States, Australia, Hungary, Canada, and Croatia. And these dogs came not just to meet up with other Goldens, but also participated in events, including hunting dog demos, dog shows, and behavior classes. This is not the first time this Golden gathering has happened. Golden retriever lovers have come together to page homage to Sir Dudley Major Banks, who's credited with the Golden Retriever breed development back in 1868. He bred a wavy coated retriever with a tweed water spaniel. Now I have to confess, those must be British breeds because I've never heard of either one of those until I looked up this article. But since our guest is is from uh, the other side of the pond, perhaps she wants to comment on the wavy coated retriever and the tweed water spaniel. Sir Dudley, Mix these two breeds together because he wanted a companion with a beautiful head, loving disposition, and soft, melting eyes that lived to fetch game. And does that not describe the Golden Retriever absolutely perfect? These dogs are really just such lovely animals. Apparently, uh, along with the melting eyes came an obsession with tennis balls and rolling in the dirt. Interestingly, despite this breed's enormous popularity, the Golden Retriever has never won best in show at New York City's own Westminster Kennel Club show, which they're always 
dozens of golden retrievers on display at Westminster, but they just never seem to make it to the top of the pile. Well, maybe one day. So if you want to see amazing, wonderful photos about golden retrievers in Scotland, just Google golden retrievers in Scotland. And now it's my pleasure to welcome today's special guest to Ask the Vet podcast, Helen Irving. She's the new, although new is kind of a relative term, she's been with us for several months now, the new president and chief executive officer here at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. Welcome, Helen. You have such rich experiences from working in human health care for the past 30 years. You were a nurse, uh, both in the U.S., Canada, and also across the pond, vice president of hospital operations at Mount Sinai Medical Center, and most recently, president and CEO of Live On New York, which is a uh, not-for-profit organ procurement organization. So welcome, and thank you for coming. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to the podcast. So. I want to get to the most important question of the day. Who are the furry members of the Irving household? <laughs> so we have two furry members in this household. Um, one is a rescue cat who's about 15 years old now, came from the New York City pound. Um, we actually, it was, they had a special. It was buy one, get one free. So we bought two home, an older cat called Jack and a younger cat who's now called Fidget. And unfortunately, Jack passed away some years ago, but Fidget is alive and well at 15 and rules the house. And the other animal is a Welsh terrier who is called Reggie Jack. And he's not named after Reggie Jackson. He is named in honor of Jack, the cat that we lost. So Reggie is his first name, Reggie Jack. And actually he is, his breed uh, kennel name is Czar Reggie Jack Irving Rock. But there you oh go. My goodness. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> so a Quite Welsh off. Terrier. Yeah. For, for those of you who are unfamiliar with a Welsh Terrier, they're kind of look like a baby Airedale. Yep. That's uh, and it. they're they're not that much. I don't know that I could tell the difference between a Welsh Terrier, a Lakeland Terrier and a wire hair fox terrier they they're all quite similar um, in appearance they're similar but they the welshies have what they call a jacket so the the true breed has a black body with orange um tan legs and and face so they it looks like they're wearing a dinner jacket that's the breed um and so where a wire fox is white with tan um, predominantly white and a Lakeland has a little uh, he's more mellow um, so yeah the Welsh is quite distinct in in the jacket cut that they have we don't see very many Welsh terriers in New York City at all not many it's one of the oldest breeds actually in the world um, it's about 3,000 years old as a breed um, but the criteria for the Welshie was we were living in a fifth floor walk up so 72 stairs and the dog had to be able to make it up the stairs on his own and was small enough should he get sick that we could carry him up or down the stairs. So that's how come we ended up with the Welshie. People in people outside of, of urban areas, especially urban areas with vertical residences like yep. we have in New York, don't understand how important it is for your dog to be able to do stairs. Oh, yeah, because, you know, I originally wanted an Airedale. You know, my husband and I were fighting over this. He wanted an English Bulldog and I wanted the Airedale. So the English Bulldog couldn't go up and down the stairs and the Airedale was too big to carry up and down the stairs. So... Well, I think I think <laughs> English Bulldogs are too big to carry up and down stairs. They're exactly, essentially a yeah. 60 pound dog with six inch legs. Exactly. Exactly. So he wasn't going up and down the stairs either. <laughs> All right. So we could talk about dogs all day, but yeah. I guess I should really ask you the, the questions here that I have so the listeners um, can understand more about you and and how you got to the Animal Medical Center. Um, what what lessons from the human world prepared you for this current role running a veterinary hospital? So I think the first one is interesting. The first part of the question is, you know, how did I get to be an AMC, right? You know, how does a nurse from London, England end up over here? Um, and I had actually retired from my previous CEO position. Um, you know, after COVID, I decided it was time for me to move on. So I was quite happy, you know, living upstate, 
um, hanging out, you know, on a, on a small uh, hay farm that we own, when I got a call from the search committee that were looking for a case replacement, who was a fabulous CEO here who, uh, before me. And the first comment I had to the recruiter was, you know, well, um, you must have been hitting over the head with a two by four because I'm not a veterinarian. Um, and with that, she laughed and said, well, actually, it's a hospital, and that's why we'd like to put you forward. And that piqued my interest more and more. And as I learned more about the Animal Medical Center, and obviously having to do a very quick study on veterinarian medicine in general, but it was the hospital, it was the AMC, the Schwarzman AMC, that really piqued my interest at that point in time. And I started to learn more and more about it, realizing that wow, this is actually the size of a community hospital in human terms. It has everything that we have in, in human healthcare. So there's an MRI, a CT scan, a linear accelerator. We do have a comprehensive oncology center, you know, cardiology, everything that was new, was actually known to me exists at the at the AMC so from that moment on I was hooked um it was a fascinating place and once I came to visit I was I was even more hooked I actually told my husband I said I I, I think I'm I'm sold hook line and sinker on this one just for the listeners out there if you're interested on the December 2020 two podcast um featured uh Kate Coyne our our former CEO that um, Helen just alluded to in her remarks, uh, and that you can download off of your uh, podcast platforms, Apple or whatever you use. Um, you've talked a little bit about the hospital aspect of it, mm -hmm. making, making you see that you could fit here as the right. CEO. What lessons did you learn in the human healthcare world that you can adapt to AMC? So, you know, hospitals are a little bit like Rubik's Cubes. You know, you kind of, you, you, there's a lot of components to it that really have to have a lot of synergy and, and there's a lot of moving parts. And so learning and understanding those moving parts in a human hospital also translates over to AMC. So you have to, I believe, learn and i have learned through experience that the the biggest challenge you have as an executive leader is really to stop and listen more than anything else is learning to listen to what you're being told listen to how the amc works listen to how the veterinarians take care of, of their patients which are animals but i still call with them patients right um and really learning ground up how AMC is put together so that I can better understand that Rubik's Cube at the end of the day and, and how to align everything. And so I think that experience, that the experience I bring to the table is from having been in other hospitals and seeing how human healthcare runs and learning to bring some of that technology over as well to the benefit of AMC. Um, you know, there's a lot that we do, like, um, you know, the electronic medical record, making sure that we have a robust electronic medical record, because that drives the engine of the medical care. So there's a lot of things that we can do that will um, be integrated into AMC in the future. And, okay, so that's how it's the same. How, besides the fact that we don't have beds, we have cages and runs. Yeah. Yeah. What what yeah. else is different? <laughs> well, I tell I tell my colleagues, my friends, when they because my friends are all fascinated by by my work, right? And I used to say that it, it was a hospital, right? And I I changed my mind on that. I actually said it, it's actually not an adult hospital; it's a pediatric hospital. And the reason why I say pediatrics is because our patients can't speak for themselves, right? Children can't either. And so the voice of the child and the voice of our patients is through their owners. And our veterinarians are very similar to pediatricians 
in that you know they provide just this exquisite care that they just want to have that relationship with their patient and their client and that is very unique in pediatrics and it's very unique in veterinarian medicine um, I've seen a level of expertise both in the techs and in the and the doctors that that excels far beyond some of what I've seen in human medicine, to be quite honest with you. There are some doctors here, if I got sick, I'd love to have them look after me, except that, you know, I'd have to put on a doggy outfit. But um, they're such good clinicians. Um, and so I think I was really surprised at the overall commitment, the training, the rigor, everything else that goes into being a veterinarian and a licensed technician. Um, is is really quite amazing how much energy you've all put into your careers. Now I have a two-part question. Um, what makes you most excited about AMC? And then the other, the other thing is, what was the most surprising thing? Like the snake in the CT scanner? Or <laughs> yeah, else? no snakes, thank you very much. Yeah, no, no, not doing that. You know... I mean, I'm excited for the future of AMC. Um, you know, I did promise myself that I would never do another construction project. And I think because I've done many, that's a strength coming to AMC. And I find myself in the middle of a construction project, which, um, you know, has, has a finite life. Um, but, you know, I, I think AMC, when we are finished and we are done and we will have a spectacular hospital, I think the future of AMC is incredibly bright, and I'm really looking forward to advancing um, the education, the mission of AMC through education and through research. So I think that's what makes me excited, is to really um, do more in that realm, because the clinicians take great care of the pets and the animals. So that's not an area where I worry so much but where I really want to focus is on research and education and how can we improve that for nationally with a national footprint. Um, what surprises me is um, being in the middle of a construction project. <laughs> um, I think the impact of the construction is, is quite, quite difficult for many of us to get through and get our heads around to understand. Um, you know, we have another 18 months to go. And so I'm hoping that we can make that as painless as possible for everyone involved so that we can get through and put this behind us. So, so when when Helen talked about moving parts of a hospital, all I could think about was our moving front door, which yes. seems the entrance to the building because of construction, the entrance of the building seems to move about every two weeks. You come to work and you're like, huh, I went in here yesterday. I wonder how I get in now. So now we have like a two foot high sign that says enter this way with a big arrow right. by it right. and signs taped all over the uh, the elevators but that's one of our biggest moving parts right now is yeah. the front yeah. door um, yeah which, the front door the front door where where are we going to put pe people's bikes right um how are we going to get people up the stairs and so on and so forth the only thing i can say is that when when the elevators are limited and we're using the stairs, it's doing an awful lot for our waistline. Like at least we're getting some exercise up and down the stairs. I, I can log, I usually log 5,000 steps a day here. Um, yeah, because I back and that forth easily. and around. Yeah, yeah, easily. So it, I don't, you don't need a gym when you work at AMC. So if you, what, what do you say to your friends? You said your friends are interested in understanding your work. So these people don't know anything about AMC, right? So how do you describe it to them? So for my, for my healthcare colleagues, you know, I describe it, like you said, it's, it's a hospital, just that I don't have beds. I have cages and my patients have four legs and an occasional beak. So, well, no, we have some two-legged patients yeah, and we have an occasional zero-legged patient yes, as yeah, well. Those are, yeah, those, those I'm not so keen on. But, you know, but, you know from, from that perspective, they understand a hospital. Um, you know, what I explained to someone, you know, to give you an idea, a day in the life of a CEO at a AMC, right? So 
I was off site one Thursday morning uh, with some meetings um, with uh, our legal team because we're looking at, you know, expanding. So I left that meeting. I came running back to AMC about 11 o'clock in the morning. My surgeons called me to say, hey, Helen, can you come down to the OR? The whole team was there. Um, and then after that, I left, went back to my office, had some meetings, and I went to leave AMC in the afternoon to find a gentleman across the street screaming for help. So I, I ran across the street to find that there was a pit bull in the back of his car giving birth to puppies. And so we very quickly grabbed a box, put the puppies in a box, grabbed the pit bull, came back into AMC through the moving doorway um, and got them back up to the emergency room. And so when I describe my day to my colleagues like that, most of them, the first thing they ask me is, how, how do I get to come and work at AMC? Every single one of them would love to be where, where we are. If they can find the front door. If they can um, find the front door. <laughs> so over the last couple of months, we've had a couple big events here at AMC. Um, the first one was our 15th annual Living Legends uh, luncheon event. Mm -hmm. And the second one was AMC's 59th graduation um, of interns. Uh -huh. So that's a big deal here. And so I, I wonder what you thought those experiences were like. I loved living legends. I just was blown away by the stories and um, because we have so many stories, we could do living legends every day of the week, as far as I'm concerned, um, because they, they're just, they just showcase what we do every day and what you do every day, taking care of these animals. Um, and from the cat that needed cancer treatment to the parrot that, you know, it had a stroke, but now was singing again. I mean, how amazing is that? So that was quite an honor to be able to to um, present all of those stories um, and lovely to meet all of the trustees that are supporting us as well. I did enjoy graduation. For me, that will always be special because it was my first um, you know, and, it, and my my remarks at that graduation really did come from the heart that, you know, they were the 59th graduation. They will always be my first. Um, they are the group that welcomed me into AMC that taught me how to look at the world through their eyes, through their lens. Um, and they help me understand what the needs are for the veterinarian community. And I, I think that's important, a learning point for me as a CEO. So just for the listeners out there, the, the story about the parrot that had a stroke and then started singing again, those videos are actually on AMC's website. And the, the guy talking about the parrot is absolutely hilarious yes. um and the stories um are videoed and on there and so i'm certain that if you just put in mcny.org in the search bar you would find uh living legends 15th annual living legends videos and you can watch these if you didn't happen to see them um but they were exceptional ones uh this year and yeah. and you know i think the stories are better videotaped we used to yes, do them yes. live and they're they're much better videotaped because i think the presenters are less nervous and the videotapes allow everyone even those people who can't attend lunch to recognize yeah. what wonderful stories they are yeah and they were done in the comfort of people's homes as well which i think makes a huge difference yeah yeah, I think it's much better. But then if you do go to Living Legends, you actually get to meet them. So the parrot, the cat and the dog were all at lunch that day, which yeah. is um, really, really fun. Uh, yeah, to, yeah. To I think the parrot was them. the most photographed, right? <laughs> Well, he was everyone was doing was a selfie unique. with the parrot, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the parrot was a very, very unique um, situation. Um, so I want to let you have the floor and say, is there anything um, that I that you think the public should know uh, about AMC or the role of the CEO that that we haven't touched upon today? Well, I think AM, AMC especially, you know, think of it in human terms, um, if you don't think of it in veterinarian terms. But, you know, when you see your own doctor and, you know, you have something going on where you need to see a specialist that's really AMC. 
um, you know, we, we see the unusual, we see the complicated, we see everything where people may be scratching their heads thinking, hmm, not too sure about that. And so they, animals come to us for those reasons. Um, so we, we really are a specialty practice um, bar any other. And that there's reasons why we're as good as we are because of the staff and the everyday doctors that take care of these patients. Um, as a CEO, it's always a privilege to be in this seat and to be a part of making the magic that's AMC, right? So I think that I want to spin off of that a little bit. Because um, today I, we saw a cat with cancer in the oncology clinic. And yes, the cat has cancer. But after listening to the owner, really her, her biggest concern was the fact that her cat had seizures. Mm. And we, we have no indication at all that the seizures in the cat were caused by the cancer that it has. Sometimes mm -hmm. cancer causes seizures, but we don't think so in this case. Right. And she was very worried about the medicine the cat was on and the tumor that the cat has, she can't see it's inside. Her veterinarian has a hard time finding it. And so did we, but, but we ultimately could feel it there and it has been seen on ultrasound. And what was she most grateful for today? Not our cancer plan, but the fact that we said, well, we think neurology could do a consultation for you today if you could wait another 45 minutes because they have an open spot in their day today. And right. so they, they came up with a plan to help manage her seizures. We've got a plan to manage the cancer. And it, it all happened today because right. AMC has this staff that's willing to work together mm -hmm. um, and and has the expertise to manage a cat with cancer and a cat that has seizures at the same time um, right. to, to have the best outcome. And so I would say that it's it, yes, it's our expertise, but it's also the aggregate of the expertise of the doctors at the Animal Medical Center. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Because, you know, I, I've sat in cardiology, for example, when they've been doing echoes and primary cares walked in and said, I have a client here. Could you possibly just do a quick echo? Because I'm not too sure what's going on with this animal's heart failure. Right. So that's on the spur of the moment that they're able to co coordinate care together. Um, the other thing that I was always impressed me is the use of technology. So with the ultrasounds being much more, we use a lot more ultrasounds here than we do in human hospitals, for example. Um, you know, so you being able to have a quick ultrasound on, on a, you know, if you wait a few more minutes, we can just run upstairs and do this for you and get a clearer diagnosis, I think is really important. You don't have to come back a second time. Um, well, I, I, you know, part of our use of ultrasound is the anesthesia issue. So mm -hmm. when I have a problem, the doctor's like, okay, well, you need to call radiology and get yourself a CT scan. But we think twice in veterinary medicine about a quick CT scan because the quick CT scan or a long CT scan both right. involve anesthesia. Correct. And, and people, anesthesia is in animals is, is quite safe, but they still don't like it. Right. Mm -hmm. And it bothers them. And so because we can usually do ultrasound on an awake animal, um, right. it, it's it's way more popular. Yes. I, I think the yes. other thing is um, for the listeners out there, just so you have a visual, when you go get an ultrasound, you usually have a little couch that you lay on and they ultrasound you. In animals, we have a little U-shaped foam bed well, actually, we have many of different sizes <laughs> right. because we need them for different two pounders and two hundred yeah. pounders, yeah. and and so we have them in in this U-shaped bed getting their ultrasound. So there, people are surprised. I mean, you don't have to put them out. They say to me, and it, it's right. because we've got these little foam U-shaped beds that allow um, allow us to have the animal comfy. Uh, right. while they're getting right. that quick ultrasound. Yeah, and it's the same. I've watched them do, you know, the chest x-rays and all the x-rays that they do um, without anesthesia, right? Because um, they just do it really technically great and fast. Um, and so that's that, I think, is a bonus too. 
Yes. And, it, and, and because radiology is really good at getting those animals to hold still just long enough for those x-rays, um, it, it, we use a lot of mm -hmm. x-rays. I don't think anyone right. ever recommends I get an x-ray, hardly ever. Oh, I know. I haven't had one in years. <laughs> uh, I had one because they were looking for kidney stones. But right. um, that we use x-rays a lot more, again, because we can do them without anesthesia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we just have a minute left. Um, I want to say, what do you do for fun? What do I do for fun? Oh, I, I am a big hiker. I love to hike. So the dog comes hiking too. And uh, oh, baking. If I can bake every weekend, I'm happy. That's kind of like my therapy. So watch out. I'll start baking cakes and bring them into AMC. So, uh, well, I, you know, we've talked about having an AMC chocolate chip cookie bake off. Uh, oh yeah, a competition. Yeah. You uh -huh. clearly can't be a judge because you're going to be an entrant. I can tell. Oh, I would be an entrant. I can do any. I love like making the great big three tier stack cakes. Those those are my specialty. Oh, those, those are not good for me. Not good. I kind of am more like the quick cake person. Like I'm waiting for the plums to come at the farmers market so yep. that we that I can make the New York Times plum cake recipe. Uh huh. Yep. Yep. Uh, that I, would be that's work. a that's a really good one. One of my yeah, but other than that, you'll find me, you know, I love land management being outside, you know, we have 52 acres. So we're usually doing something with the trees or hay in the land, that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm pretty much outdoors. Well, Helen, it has been an absolute pleasure to ch chat with you this afternoon here on Ask the Vet. I want to thank you so much. And when we come back from our break, I will answer questions uh, from our listeners. If you want your question answered here on Ask the Vet, just email me your questions at askthevet at amcny.org and I'll answer next month. See you after the break. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Welcome back to Ask the Vet. It's time for the animal news. It's time for animal headlines, the biggest animal news from across the world. The first animal news story today is Rufus. Rufus is a specially trained hawk who had one of the most important jobs at Wimbledon. No, Rufus is not a ball boy. Rufus is the king of center court as recognized by the New York Times. Rufus worked tirely to ensure that the grassy courts were kept clear of pigeons who would fly down to munch on grass during the matches. During the 42 day long tournament, Rufus would begin each day flying around Wimbledon's courts to scare away pigeons that may have tried to roost during the prior evening. Full disclosure, no pigeons were hurt. Rufus just scares them away. How did Rufus get this job at Wimbledon? Well, back in 1999, a falconer named Donna Davis was watching a match of the eventful champion that year, Pete Sampras. And throughout the hours long match, a plague of pigeons repeatedly disrupted the action on the court. She called the Wimbledon organizers and officed her and Rufus's service and the rest is history. Just so you know, Rufus is a Harris hawk. And according to my favorite bird book, he is chocolate brown and chestnut red. He weighs a little over a pound and is about 18 inches long. So just Google Rufus the Hawk at Wimbledon to see a picture of this handsome fellow for more information and even a video. The second pet we have today in the animal news, I think is probably well known to most listeners. This is a two-year-old German Shepherd named Commander who happens to live in the White House. And unfortunately, poor Commander made headlines this month because he reportedly has bitten several Secret Service agents. So as a veterinarian, I can tell you there are lots of reasons why dogs bite. Most commonly, the dog is reacting to something, whether it's a stressful event, an uncomfortable situation, whether they're scared, have been startled, maybe they're sick. Uh, they may also bite to protect something of value, like food, toys, puppies, a bone. In these situations, the dog might require the help of a professional trainer. News of Commander's biting episodes actually puts a much needed spotlight on an important public health issue, and that is dog bites. According to the United States Centers for Disease Control, which you might know as the CDC, 
There are more than 4.5 million Americans bitten by dogs each year. I mean, that's a huge number. And more than 800,000 of these bite victims receive, receive medical attention. So if you're bitten by a dog, there's a one in five chance that you need to go to the ER. At least half the people that are bitten are children. And what's really interesting is that children are more likely to be severely injured and they are more likely to be bitten during everyday activities while interacting with the family dog or a dog that's known to them. They're not bitten by random dogs on the street. They're, they're bitten by dogs that are in their day to day. So that brings up a couple of points. First of all, always ask the dog's owner or handler if you can pet it. And if they say no, please respect that. You can learn dog body language to help you avoid situations where a dog is stressed and upset and likely to bite. And AMC's Usdan Institute for Animal Health Education has a lovely graphic on dog body language. Just go to amcny.org and search dog body language. The other really interesting article related to Commander's story was in the op-ed section of the New York Times yesterday, and it was by Alexander Horowitz, who's a uh, dog cognition expert at Barnard College, and she writes about the reasons that Commander might bite. Uh, definitely worth a read by searching Alexander Horowitz in the New York Times. Our third story today is from the Sint Trudeau Hospital in Belgium. And this is really a wonderful human companion animal bond story. This hospital opened a special pavilion so that the patients can visit with their furry loved ones while they're in the hospital. The new indoor space has been funded by a charity, was created to help boost the well being of palliative and long term care patients who can't go home to see their favorite pet and they can have quality time in this indoor pavilion. For patient Greta Bonnet, reunion with her beloved dog Rambo was a boost to her, her morale. And she said, seeing your dog in itself does not cure you, but it gives you a lift. And it means a lot to the animal too. You can't complain, explain to a dog what's going on and why you're not around to take care of them. So far, most owners have requested visits from their dog, but if somebody has a cat they want to visit, that cat can visit too. The hospital also plans to use the pavilion for sessions with a charity that uses therapy dogs to improve mental and motor skills for patients undergoing rehabilitation therapy. For more information and photos, just Google Belgium Hospital Allows Pets to Visit. And now let's go to questions from our listeners. First, I have to say that so many of you wrote in this month, I, I will answer as many questions as I can. But if you sent a question in this month and I don't get to it, check AMC's blog and I'll answer questions that I didn't get to uh, from this month's set uh, in a blog post coming up. Our first question comes from Claudia. Claudia has a 12-year-old rescue dog named Monkey, who has sticky stuff on his fur around his eyes that seem to be impeding his vision. She wants to know how best to remove it without using harsh chemicals. She said Monkey is such a sweet boy who's had such a rough life and doesn't like to have his face touched, but Claudia needs to clean it. So, Claudia, uh, here at AMC, our ophthalmologist likes a product called Lid and Lash eye cleaner. And it's a product specifically for dogs and cats. And it comes in a little jar with little um, pledgets that are moist and help to get that goo off the fur and face. If you can't find the lid and lash, then you might use OcuSoft wipes. Those are wipes for people eyes. And you can buy those over the counter in a regular drugstore. But I think there's more to this story than just eye cleaning. I'm a little worried that Monkey the Rescue Dog might have dry eye, meaning he doesn't make enough tears. And when dogs have dry eye, they get a lot of crusty, sticky discharge around their eyes. And the other thing that you might see is that their nostrils look really dry and crusty because when you don't make tears, 
um, then your your nose is not moist because the tears have a duct that runs down the nose and helps to keep that little brown dog nose moist. So if you notice that monkey's nose is kind of dry and the eyes are still gooey after you clean them up, I think that you should have him tested for dry eye by your veterinarian. Our next question comes from Patricia. And Patricia writes, Dear Dr. Ann, my seven-year-old dog has developed a lump on the side of his body. It doesn't seem to bother him or affect his daily life. My husband took him to our local vet who did blood work and took samples from the lump. He did not take x-rays. The next day, the vet called and said the lump was not cancerous. It's just a fatty lump. Thankfully, my dog is fine. But my question for you is, should I consider having the fatty lump removed? So fatty lumps are one of the most common skin masses that we see in dogs. And Patricia did exactly the right thing by having her veterinarian test the mass and send the mass away to the laboratory to determine the content of that test on the mass. And when it's a fatty lump, there's not a reason that the lump has to be removed, not like if it was malignant. But a fatty lumps we take off when they are causing some sort of discomfort or dysfunction in our dog patients. So if this is just a small cherry sized mass on the side of the dog, not causing a problem, I don't think it's necessary to have it removed. But sometimes these masses get really big and they make it hard for the dog to walk or lie down or, or move normally. And in those cases, we take them off. Um, we had a couple of patients probably in the last year who had huge fatty tumors taken off by AMC's Dr. Spector. And if you go to AMC's website, I wrote a blog that showed pictures of these dogs before and after. So you might want to Google lipoma. Uh, that's the name of a fatty tumor in the AMC search bar. And you can see what I mean when these dogs function and comfort was disturbed by the fatty mass. And that's when we took them off of these two dog patients. Good luck to you, Patricia, um, with your dog. And I hope the lump isn't causing a problem. And finally, we have a question from Anna. Anna would like to know what causes the matting of cat's fur and what's the best way to deal with this problem? You know, Anna, I'm not really sure what causes cats to mat exactly, but it's gotta be something about the fur because you've got some cats that never get a mat ever in their lives. And then you've got cats that are just like mat city. So what, it, what a mat is, is just dead hair that doesn't fall out and then it gets tangled up and it, it gets tighter and tighter as time goes on. I'm not really sure why it does that either. So it's important to either brush if you have a mat forming cat, you need to brush that cat every day, or maybe you need to send the cat out to the groomer to get what we call a lion cut, which is trim the fur on the body and leave the feet and head and tail uh, long and fluffy. Other things to help prevent mats besides brushing and clipping is take off the collar and or harness because the rubbing of the harness on the fur causes that mats to form underneath the collar or the harness. And an important thing to do is don't think that bathing your pet with mats is going to get rid of the mats because it only makes them worse. They get tighter and tighter as they get wet and then dry. So sometimes mats are so tight that the pet can't move normally because the mat is pulling on their skin. And if they move, it hurts. And other times, if the mat gets wet, the skin under the mat gets all raw and infected. And then the cat A, smells bad and is miserable. So be sure to demat your cat on a regular basis by brushing and clipping and getting rid of any dead hair and taking off the collar and harness whenever you don't really need them on your pet. That's all the time we have folks today for questions. Check the blog for answers to questions I didn't get to today. And when we come back, we'll have news from AMC and the USDAN Institute. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Hi, and welcome back to Ask the Vet podcast. Don't forget that I can answer your pet health questions in next month's show. And all you need to do is send me an email 
at askthevet at amcny.org. With temperatures across the country at all-time highs, actually across the world at all-time highs, keep in mind that dogs and cats are at risk for heat stroke. The risk is greater if you have a flat-faced dog or cat, like a pug uh, or a Persian cat. If you have a dog with a dark coat, they soak up the sun and all that heat when they're outside. And then remember that very old and very young animals can't cope with heat as well as kind of the more typical age animals do. And then finally, pets that are overweight uh, are much more prone to heat stroke. And then don't forget your pets with heart and respiratory conditions. So when it's hot outside, be sure that it's cool inside where they are and take them out to walk only early in the day and late in the day when it's not so hot. For those of you worried about recognizing signs of heat stroke, I'm gonna outline them for you. First, we have agitation. The pet just seems anxious and restless and can't settle. You might see heavy panting. You might see agitation and noisy breathing. Other things to look for, drooling, 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 drooling like crazy. A pet with unsteady gait, weak, vomiting, or diarrhea. And then if the pet's not responding to you or maybe having a seizure, you've waited too long. That is the moment you need to get in the car and go to a veterinary emergency facility so they can cool your pet off. Remember, short walks early in the morning and in the evening, be sure to take water and a bowl with you so the dog can have a drink and never ever leave a dog or a cat in a carrier in a car for a few minutes on these hot last few days we have of the summer. Fido needs to stay home. I hope you'll join us for our sixth annual Celebration of Life event. This event remembers the pets and honors the lives of the pets who are no longer with us, but who've shared our lives together. This event will include a candle lighting ceremony and a pet memorial slideshow at the conclusion of the event. Once you register for the event, you can submit a photo, photo of your beloved pet. As with all Use Dan Institute events, registration is free, but required so we can send you the Zoom link. For more details, please visit amcny.org backslash use Dan events. That's U-S-D-A-N-E-V-E-N-T-S. If you're looking for a trusted source of pet health information, look no further than the Use Dan Institute's online pet health library. It contains a wealth of pet health information from veterinary experts at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center. And to access it, just log into AMC's website, and at the very top, click on the light blue box that says pet health information in our uh, top of our ribbon. I want to give my thanks to Helen Irving, the new president and chief executive officer here at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center for joining me today. And as always, I appreciate everyone who has downloaded our Ask the Vet podcast. Don't forget to like the podcast and sign up so you get every episode as soon as it drops. With your continued support, our Ask the Vet podcast is ranked number four on Feedspot's 2023 Top 45 Pet Health Podcast. If you have a question about your pet's health, then take a moment and click send me an email. That email one last time is askthevet at amcny.org, and I'm going to answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet show. Don't forget to check out the Animal Medical Center on social media. On Facebook, it's The Animal Medical Center. And on Twitter and Instagram, it's AMCNY. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast. Have a great end of the summer, everyone. And I'll see you back here in September for another episode of Ask the Vet.